let's start um, if you are watching online please come back <laughs> okay so last time we stopped here okay and that's called the mass spectrometer and it's used a lot in chemistry biology so it's used to sort out isotopes or, or find the mass of isotopes so it goes in two steps that's a simplified way to do it so first you're going to accelerate the ions so you take isotopes and you take away one electron so they become uh, positively charged for example and so now they are uh, they are charged so you can apply a voltage so here i have my voltage uh, it's it's called u uppercase u because uh, so you don't confuse with v the velocity so because you have an electric field here then it's going to speed up then it enters a magnetic field and you can do the right uh, hand you know it's a very beautiful flower so very uh, beautiful is toward you see uh, b here is toward you so very beautiful uh, um, flower so the force here is going to be to the right when it enters so it's going to be a circular motion okay it's going to be uh, deflected and hi higher or larger is the mass larger is the radius makes sense because that means it has more inertia higher is the speed higher is the radius as well because if you move really fast it's harder to make a turn so you go in two steps so this is what we defined last time okay you can use that uh, you you can find that by using the the magnetic force equals to the centripetal force and then in the first phase we have the kinetic energy here equals potential energy q u you malax and massage and you get that equation here okay so you can have the mass as a function of the magnetic field square the radius square and here you have the potential okay so more potential means faster it's it's gonna go okay so that's the idea of a mass spectrometer i think i talked about that i don't i don't know if it was in the previous pop quiz or the future pop quiz but I told you that during World War II, they were trying to enrich uranium to make the bomb, the first. And uranium-235 has less mass than uranium-238. So the turn here is going to be sharper. So you can collect uranium-235 and start all over again. So it's not very efficient. They don't do that anymore when they need to enrich uranium to make a power plant. They have different ways to do it like diffusion or using lasers but that was back then it's a very cheap way to do it and at the time it was a breakthrough so we did that problem we hurry up to do that problem and then you can apply both an electric field and a magnetic field so you can do two things at the same time remember it's a vectorial sum and you can use that to have what it's called and it's also used in a mass spectrometer we're going to call that a velocity selector so how does it work so you shoot here so i'm going to i'm, I'm going to do it here so you can all see and then i'm going to move around you shoot the particles here so let's say it's here and here you have two things you have the electric field from plus to minus and you have the magnetic field going into the black ball. Okay, so you take your right hand here, and you want to know which way is the force from the magnetic field. So the force is, uh, the velocity is here, very beautiful flower. So the magnetic force is going to be in this direction. And then the electric force, of course, if it's positive, is in this direction. And then you can tune the force, you can tune the magnetic field and the electric field such as the magnetic force equals the electric force. 
So I, I will show you why do you want to do that. So this is called a velocity selector. So the velocity is this way, beautiful, is going into the black ball, magnetic force is that way, it's positive, so you want to go with the electric field, so you can tune the magnetic field or the electric field, so both forces are equal to each other, so it's going to go in a straight line. So why do you want to do that? You do that to select a given velocity. Okay, because, and that's called, a, that's called a velocity selector, and actually we do that with a mass spectrometer, so I will show you in a moment. But you see that the magnetic force here equals QVB, okay, because the angle between V and B is 90 degrees, so the sine is 1, equals the electric force here, which is QE. So you can cross out the charge, and you have VB equals E in magnitude. So you can have V, the velocity, equals E over B. So why do you want to do that? So you select a given velocity that you want, okay? So it's called the velocity selector. Do you understand? So, for example, I'm going to show you a simulation, but I'm going to show you why in a lab, and that's for people, you know, you all take chemistry, maybe some of you are going to take the MCAT, I don't know. You are all in biology, most of, the, most of you, a lot of people in biology. So, mass spectrometer is a very important uh, technology for you to understand. So, let's say I have a bunch of isotopes that I want to sort out. So the first step, I'm going to ionize them. I'm going to speed them up through a potential. That will be the first step. So you will say, OK, so that means I know the velocity. Yeah, but the velocity is not precise. If you take a static statistics class, for example, there is always like a bell curve. So if you want to select one velocity, you know, maybe it's going to have some percentage error. So it's not exact, okay? So you, you really want a given velocity. You want all the isotopes who have the same velocity. So then you can carefully sort them out or find their mass. So we use in the second step, so that will be the second phase, so if I ask you for the pop quiz, that what that thing is used for, that's used to select one given velocity, right? So all of them will go at the same speed. So second uh, step, it's called a speed selector. So they will all have the same speed. So then all the isotopes, Isotope meaning they have the same number of protons, not the same number of neutrons, so they don't have the same mass. So then you can sort them out, find their mass, or just sort them out, okay? This is called the velo velocity selector. So you apply both an electric field and a magnetic field. So I have a simulation. Uh, By the way, we have a test three next Monday, right? It will be open between, I say, 8 p.m. to 12 midnight, because I know some people have jobs. So I, make sure you plan ahead. Don't tell me that you need to have, you have a job or something. You know, plan ahead from 8 p.m. to midnight. That will be enough. The test will be online, and um, it's 10%. So it should boost your grade. So it's going to be a lot of conceptual questions. And then some things that I will take from the homework. OK, I'm not going to make it uh, too hard. OK, so here I have both an electric field going from down to left. So maybe it's a capacitor. 
So you see that the electric field is homogeneous. You see have the same direction. The line are equally spaced out. So that means the magnitude is the same all over. And you also have a magnetic field going into the blackboard. So let's say I remove the, the electric field here. I just keep the magnetic field very beautiful flower. So the force is up. So what's going to happen to it? I'm going to make it uh, go fast. Okay, I cannot go faster than that. So it's going to go into circular motion because the force is always perpendicular to the velocity. And when that happens, that's called the centripetal force. Okay. Now, if instead I remove the magnetic field, so let's um, let's remove the magnetic field, and I just have the electric field. So remember from the beginning of the semester, the electric field is going to pull the charge up. Electric field will accelerate. Magnetic field just deflect. So it will accelerate in this direction. But remember that at the same time, it has a forward motion. So it will be like a projectile motion upside down. So it's going to make a parabola. Okay, it's moving toward up, accelerating, getting faster, but at the same time it's moving forward at the same speed. So we did that a lot last semester. So it's just a review. So now what's going to happen if I make my... Okay, I change the direction of the magnetic field. So the force is going to be down. And I have the electric field up and I can tune them exactly right so you see now it's going to be in balance with a up force a down force so the net force is zero along the vertical and it's going to go in a straight line so that that is called a speed selector okay because here I can have a sensor and I will collect only the isotopes with the speed I want because I tune the electric field and the magnetic field just the right way. Oh, I didn't know it come back. Okay, that's so cool. Okay. So here, I'll let you maybe for next time pop quiz, you know, uh, first step, you accelerate a bunch of isotopes. So here it's nickel. Nickel, that's the mass of nickel. And maybe I will ask you, you know, what's going to be the speed here? That speed will have a distribution. So it's not going to be exactly the speed that I want. You can do the math. It's going to be 10,000 meters per second. It's, but there is a distribution. And then those isotopes will go through a speed selector, right? So you can compute E over B equals the speed, and you can find B. So I think that will be in the pop quiz, right? So you have that bunch of isotopes going through that. So it will be acted by a force up and a force down such as the velocity is E over B, you have the velocity, you can find B, okay? So once you have the right velocity, so now all the isotopes are moving at the right speed, so they enter the magnetic field, and you can predict, uh, you can predict the radius, right? And, and you can sort them out. So that's how it works. And, and uh, I, I put the YouTube video that will take you step by step. Okay, so very important in chemistry and uh, biology, you can sort out isotopes thanks to this technique. Okay? And, and then, uh, I don't know, I, I have a short video to show you. Mm. No, maybe I will show you that after. So just a parenthesis, 
this technique of applying both an electric field and a magnetic field was used to find in the 19th century by J.J. Thomson, so very famous physicist in England, he found the ratio between the charge of an electron and the mass of an electron. So they didn't know what was an electron, right? They didn't know its charge and they didn't know its mass. So then they use a CRT, so not, I mean, CRT meaning cathode ray tube, right? So you have an electron gun okay, that will spit out electrons. Those electrons will be speed up here in the first stage, and then they enter a velocity selector, like just I've told you. So you have both an electric field here and a magnetic field. So they will be in equilibrium between the two forces, like just I've shown you that. So you have this relationship, speed equals E over B. Okay, and, and then you use the other equation, that equation here, the, the speed equation, this, this equation here, you use that equation, I actually can go back here, one half mv squared equals QU, okay, the, the, the kinetic energy equals the potential energy, and you plug that into, okay, you understand? So you have two equations, you have because first you see the electrons is going to be are going to be speed up through a potential u so you have potential energy q u so that was the charge of an electron and it was unknown equals kinetic energy so one half mv square and then you have the equation q um no you have the equation velocity equals E over B. Okay, so first you speed up electrons, the beam of electrons, and then they enter in that region where they're going to be in equilibrium with, between an electric force and the magnetic force, right? So you have V equals E over B, and you plug that into here. And I'm sure you can all do simple algebra. And then he found the relationship between E and M. E is the charge of an electron. M is the mass of an electron. Okay? So probably some question in the next pop quiz, you know. I have to come up with something. But it's very easy. Any question? Is that clear? Just algebra, right? So that was done in 1897. Of course, it's a very famous experiment, and it used a vacuum tube, okay? So that means they took the air out, okay? So the electron will not interact with air molecules because, you know, electrons, they like to kick out air molecules, so we don't want that, so they remove the air. And those vacuum tubes uh, are actually used in the old TV. I know maybe you have grandparents who still have like the monster TV that was very bulky, that was my age, you know, my time, very bulky TV. Inside those big TV, you had like a vacuum tube inside, but a huge one, okay, very, very big. And you have a beam of electron that will sweep out the screen, and that's how you had an image that was back then. If you have an old oscilloscope, that's how it works, right? You use an electric field to deflect, deflect the beam. Okay, the deflection will depend on the voltage that you are trying to measure as a function of time. So it's kind of the same technology. So, but they didn't have the mass. And then came Millikan, very famous experiment. And we did that at the beginning of the semester. Right? So what you do, you have a, a drop that is charged uh, with an electron, let's say minus, and you have an electric field here, so QE, and you have mg, and it's falling at a constant speed, so you have to look at them, so it's falling at a constant state, so you have a relationship between Q and M. So that's how they find the mass and the charge of an electron. You still with me?
right? Okay, cyclotron is a very important application, especially in hospitals, because when you have a PET scan, you have to make those radio isotope short, short life. So you, you give the patient the isotope mixed with sugar, for example, and you want to detect a tumor, God forbid, the sugar will go to the tumor because the tumor all only grow, 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 right? So it's a radioisotope, so it goes beep, 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 and you can detect the tumor and have a, um, that will be a trace, trace method, or you can have a PET scan. So for those methods, you, you need to make radioisotope on the spot, and those radioisotopes need to have a short life because you don't want to take the bus, you know, after that and start to radiate uh, people around you. So the idea, and, and we use that also from the Large Hadron Collider. So when you are smashing protons together, right, you can destroy them. And out of E equals mc square, you destroy the mass, and uh, and out of that comes pure energy. And out of the pure energy, you can make new stuff like the Higgs boson. So the idea, okay. So you have to remember. So that would be a typical question for a pop quiz. So stay with me. If you go back to that here, you see that the time it takes to go around. I think it's in the pop quiz. The time it takes for one cycle to go around for a charged particle in the magnetic field does not depend on the speed. The radius does, yeah, the, the, uh, but, but, but the rotation speed does not, and the time it takes to go around does not depend on the speed. So that's very, very, very convenient when you have a cyclotron. So let's go back to my cyclotron here. Okay, what you're going to do? Here you're going to burp your proton, for example. You curl them, speed up, curl them, speed up. So uh, here you have a gap, and you apply an electric field here. The electric field will speed up the proton. The magnetic field here will curve it. Now, because the period does not depend on the speed, even though it's going faster and faster and faster, it will take exactly the same time to go from here to there, to do half a cycle. Okay? So each time you do half a cycle, it's going to take you the same time. So what you do, you take your electric field, you know, it's pointing in this direction. Half a cycle later is pointing in this direction. Half a cycle later is going to be in this direction. So it's oscillating. Okay, so you burp out a proton, curve, and then speed up, curve, speed up, curve, speed up, curve, speed up, curve, speed up. Burp out. Okay, so that means you can take your proton and make it faster and faster and faster and faster because you are pushing with an electric field and pushing an electric field and pushing at the per per uh, electric field. And even though it's going faster, the period is the same. Do you understand how it works? And we use that to make a PET scan, to make the radio isotopes that you're going to use in a PET scan. We're going to see next unit that a PET scan using uses uh, gamma rays, you know, from inside out. So I have a short video. Can you watch? <laughs> um, okay. Um, I don't know if you can, I hope you can hear the sound. Okay, let's see if I can make it can connect here. What if I connect here? Does it work? This bottle of compressed hydrogen gas. I, I never understand what I'm supposed to do, okay?
beginning of the world's largest and most powerful particle this bottle of compressed hydrogen gas. So it's about the Large Hadron Collider that you have between Switzerland and France. It's underneath the ground. And that's where they found the Higgs boson, which is the particle of God. You know, that's the particle that gives things mass. And it was found in 2013, I forgot, but it was a Nobel Prize, right? So the way they do it, they take protons. How do they take protons? They take hydrogen and strip the electrons out. Maybe I will ask you something like that for the pop quiz. They take the proton, they speed them up with an electric field curve. Speeding up, curve. Speeding them up, curve. Now, the radius does depend on the speed, but not the time it takes to go around. So if I ask you, you know, does the radius depend on the speed? Yes, it does. Okay. Does the period depend on the speed? No, it does not, right? Would be a nice question like this. So they speed them up, they collide them together, they destroy them, E equals mc squared, pure energy, and then out of the pure energy, you can crystallize uh, new stuff. Looks. It marks the beginning of the world's largest and most powerful particle accelerator chain, culminating in CERN's spectacular Large Hadron Collider. Hydrogen atoms from this gas cylinder are fed at a precisely controlled rate into the source chamber of a linear accelerator, CERN's LINAC-2, where their electrons are stripped off to leave hydrogen nuclei. These are protons and have a positive charge, enabling them to be accelerated by an electric field. Their journey to eventually take part in ultra-high energy collisions, similar to those following the Big Bang, can now begin. This initial acceleration has caused Lino 2 to be likened to the lumbering first stage of a huge rocket. By the time this packet of protons leaves Lino 2, it'll be traveling at one third the speed of light. It's about it's to enter the booster, booster stage two of the rocket, rocket, if you will. In order to maximize the intensity of the beam, the packet is divided into four, one for each of the booster's, the booster's rings. rings. Straight acceleration is now impractical, and the booster is circular, 157 meters in circumference. In order to accelerate the packets, they are repeatedly circulated, and the electric field is now pulsed in the same way that you push a child on a swing each time they reach a certain point. Magnets exert a force on the passing protons at right angles to their direction of motion, and so powerful electric magnets are used to bend the beam of protons round the circle. The booster accelerates the protons up to 91.6% of the speed of light and squeezes them closer together. Recombining the packet from the four rings, it's then on synchrotron, synchrotron, by analogy stage, stage three, 3 of our rocket. Let's just follow two such proton packets. The proton synchrotron is 628 meters in circumference, and they circulate for 1.2 seconds, reaching over 99.9% .9 of the velocity of light. It's here that the point of transition is reached, a point where the energy added to the protons by the pulsating electric field cannot translate into increased velocity, as they're already approaching the limiting speed of light. Instead, the added energy manifests itself as increasing mass of the protons. In short, the protons can't go faster, so they get here. The microscopic kinetic energy of each proton is measured in units called electron volts, and now the energy of each proton has risen to 25 giga electron volts, or jet. The protons are now 25 times heavier than they are at rest. The packets of protons are now jumped into stage 4, the superproton synchrotron, a huge ring 7 kilometers in circumference, designed specifically to accept protons at this energy and increase it to 450 GeV. Soon, the packets of protons will be energized sufficiently to be launched into the orbit of the gigantic Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, which lies between the Jura Mountains and the Alps, and straddles both France and Switzerland. Lying deep underground, it has a circumference of 27 kilometers. There are two vacuum pipes within the LHC, containing proton beams traveling in opposite directions. Using ultra-sophisticated kickers to synchronize incoming packets with those already circulating, 
One vacuum pipe has injected into it protons which will circulate clockwise, and the other protons which will circulate anticlockwise. The catalytic beams cross over in the four detector cavities, where they can be made to collide. The energy of the collision is double that of the individual opposing protons, and it's the debris from these collisions that is trapped in the detectors. For half an hour, the SPS injects protons. Finally, there are 2,808 packets. During this time, the LHC adds extra energy to each proton, whose velocity is now so near the speed of light that it goes around a 27km ring over 11,000 times each second, getting a boost of energy at each revolution from the pulsed electric field. Finally, each proton has an energy of 7 tera electric volts, and they're 7,000 times heavier than at rest. The magnetic force needed to keep the beams bending to the ring is so enormous that nearly 12,000 atoms must flow through its electric magnets. This is achieved by making the LHC colder than outer space, so that its magnets become superconducting. Now the protons are ready to collide with the detectors. The steering magnet finally brings them to a collision course. The total energy of two protons colliding in the LHC is 14 tera electron volt. By the way, you see one proton is not a fundamental particle. You see there are three sub particles inside that they are called quarks, okay? That, that's going to be destroyed. It produces similar states to moments after the Big Bang. Whoa. Part of the tracks of these collisions will be analyzed by computers connected to the detectors, and it's hoped these tracks will give a new insight into the very birth of our universe. How our universe has evolved, what got So it's a very interesting video. If you want, I can put it up on Moodle, but uh, a few interesting things here. So it's not a cyclotron, but nevertheless, they use the fact that as they speed up, they're going to keep exactly the same period. Okay, It takes always the same time to go around because that time only depends on the mass and the particle. It doesn't depend on the speed. So they know exactly that after one period, they can push with an electric field, right? So one period, push. One period, push. So it's going to go faster and faster and faster. The other thing he uh, mentioned is special relativity, meaning you cannot go faster than the speed of light because as you approach the speed of light, the, the particles will get heavier, right? So faster you go, heavier it gets. So you cannot go over the speed of light. So that was also interesting. It has huge amount of energy, like a tera electron volt, so seven tera electron volts, huge energy, um, and energy is money, so it costs a lot of money, so it's uh, uh, many European countries getting together and to pay for that. And I, I forgot the year, but in 2013, or, or I, I, I don't know, I have to check it out, they discovered the Higgs boson. Okay, so that's the God particle if you are into physics. Okay, so cyclotron, so I talked about that. So, okay, that's that's what we just seen here. You, you have the CMS, which is a detector, and ALICE, which is another detector. Of course, it doesn't, that's just to simplify. Uh, the, you don't have a magnet, okay, because magnets are not strong enough. They use an electromagnet and they use supraconductor to make sure that the magnetic field will be very strong. They don't use a battery, of course, you know, they just use a voltage that they apply. But I think it's a very nice way to explain. So if I ask you questions for the pop quiz, um, that's, that's not hard. So that's what a cyclotron looks like. You curve biomagnetic field speed up. The idea is that you don't need something linear. Okay, you could take something linear and apply a uh, it's very strong voltage, but in that case, it takes too much place, right? So they used to make accelerator like this, but but takes too much space, so they, they had are doing it that way. So that's a cyclotron. It's a particle accelerator, and it's used for those going into medicine, is used in hospitals. So I will tell you more about that when we get to electromagnetic waves. But the idea is that in hospitals, 
when you are doing a PET scan or when you are trying to find the location of a tumor, for example, or you want to look at your thyroid here, then you need to have radioisotope with a short life. So you have to make those radioisotopes. So example, you will have a cyclotron in the hospital. That's why PET scans are so expensive. You cannot find them like in uh, urgent care, of course. You can find a CAT scan and, or, or X-ray because they are very cheap to make. But cyclotron is very expensive, so it's only available in big hospitals. So you have the, uh, the, you have the proton, you know, speeding up, speeding up, speeding up, shooting. So it's used like a projectile. And here you have a nitrogen molecule, which is not radioactive, okay? And by shooting at it, you make it radioactive. So it's called artificial radioactivity. That was uh, invent not invented, but discovered by Irene Curie. Uh, she died from cancer, you know, from uh, discovering it, like her mom, Marie Curie, who... Uh, who work on radium, and at the time they didn't know that radium were very dangerous, so Marie Curie died from leukemia. And, um, okay, I'm not going to take a tension. So nitrogen molecule is not radioactive. You shoot a proton, and what do you make? Here you're going to make a carbon-11 nucleus, which is radioactive. Okay? So you take that radioactive isotope, say... You mix it with sugar, okay? The sugar will go inside your body somewhere. And inside your body, this radioisotope will decay. It will burp out anti-electrons that will combine with electrons inside your body. And you're going to be highlighted by gamma rays from inside out. That's what we call the PET scan. So I will go into more details so I can tell you how it works if you are into nuclear medicine. Some, I have some students who are in nuclear medicine who work like an intern, but that's how it works. So for example, um, oxygen, that will be for your brain because brain lacks oxygen. So if you want to have a PET scan of your brain, you're gonna use radioactive oxygen that you make with a cyclotron. If you are looking at the thyroid, you will use iodine, you will make iodine Radioactive, it will go here and then it will highlight from inside out. So you have different radius, YouTube. I'm sure you can make things understand what it means. If you want me, I can talk to you after the class. Well, that's one application for those going into medicine, nuclear medicine, radiotherapy. And then another application um, of that magnetic field is a tokamak. So tokamak is used to trap plasma. So if you have plasma, which is ionized gas, very hard gas, ionized gas, you know, you cannot keep it in a, in a box. So what you have here is looks like a donut, and you have a magnetic field here, very strong from electromagnet. And those ionized gas, those ions will be trapped inside and, and they will circle out. And what you can try to do, you can try to do fusion. Okay, you can, you can try to fuse hydrogen into helium. So that's what they try to do. You don't have many of them. I think there is one in Japan. Uh, I recommend that you Google it if you're interested. Okay. So let's compare electric field, magnetic field. Only the electric field can speed up particles. Magnetic field just curl them. Magnetic field can act on a particle only if the particle is charged and only if it's moving and only if there is a component perpendicular to the magnetic field. So the magnetic force is very picky compared to the electric force. Electric force is just QE, okay? And of course, it doesn't matter if the charge is moving or not, it will pull on it. So uh, two uh, like charge repel, unlike charge attract. You can have uh, uh, the same thing for magnet, except there is no such thing as a monopole. So you can have a positive charge by itself, 
but you cannot have a North Pole or a South Pole. So if you find one on your way out, you get Nobel Prize, okay, instantaneously. So make sure to pick it up, right? Because that's what they are looking for and they never find it. So there is no monopole. The other thing special is that an electric field, when it's static, okay, so when the charge is not moving, the electric field diverge or converge. But a magnetic field, even though the current is constant, an electric field always circulates, okay, like likes to make loops. It doesn't diverge. And this is just conceptual, but you can translate that as complicated equation. If you take calculus three, these are called the electromagnetic uh, Maxwell equations, okay? That, um, that says that the magnetic field will circulate around the current, that the uh, electric field will diverge around the charge. Okay, so just a summary. A lot of uh, applications, especially if you are in engineering, so here there is a mistake somewhere, but if you have a current flowing, so current is a positive charge, and if you apply a magnetic field here, what's going to happen? Uh, you, you're going to develop a voltage in between here and there. So I refer you to your textbook because I want to move on. But that's, that's a way, it's called the Hall effect. And by finding that voltage here, you can measure the magnetic field or you can measure the current. So it's used a lot. So it's called the Hall effect, right? So for example, here you have a current flowing. You apply a magnetic field. The magnetic field is going to move the positive charge on one side. And here you have a negative charge. So that will provide a voltage. By measuring the voltage, you can find the current or you can find the magnetic field. So for example, here, you can use that to find how fast something is spinning. So you have water in a pipe here, the thing is spinning, you attach a magnet here, you have your sensor there. It's a very cheap sensor, you can learn about it here. So as the magnet, you know, pass by the sensor, you're going to develop a voltage and you can find, you know, the, the cycle, how long it takes to go voltage, no voltage, voltage, no voltage, and you can find the speed of uh, rotation. Okay, so if you are into computer science, for example, uh, it's super cool to use with Arduino, um, a lot of fun. I, I had students, I used to teach about Arduino, so I had students using a sensor um, to find the magnetic field. I forgot something with parking the car. But anyway, these, these sensors, magnetic field sensors, using the whole effect are super cheap and very easy to use with Arduino. Arduino is super easy to use. You know, a three years old can use Arduino. It's a microcontroller, but it's made super easy because you need to program it with C, and C is easy at that level. So it's a lot of fun. Okay, next. Any questions so far? So we go to Ampere's law. So, so far, we have learned that the source of magnetism is moving charge. Okay, so the way you explain how magnetism is produced is because you have moving charges. So even if you have a magnet, a permanent magnet, the magnetism is due to moving electrons, right? The, the electrons move into orbit, so they will behave like a loop like one, one, one magnetic dipole, one single loop. Do you remember when electricity, you know, goes into a loop, you have the north here and the south there. And then if you apply a magnetic field and the material is ferromagnetic, so it will align with the magnetic field. We, we've learned that. So that's how you can explain how magnets work. Same thing in the earth, in the outer core, you have moving ions, 
right? And that moving ions, those moving ions create a magnetic field. Actually, it would be this, this way because the magnetic self is at the north pole and the magnetic north is at the south pole. Uh, that's one equation of Maxwell. Uh, that's the expression for a flux. So remember Gauss law for electricity. It says if you have a charge here, so let's say you have a positive charge, it's, it's going to make an electric uh, field that will diverge, at least if your charge is not moving. So it's a static, static electric field. So electric field, when it's static, it likes to diverge. If, if you take a bag, a closed bag around that charge, remember that Gauss law says that the flux of the electric field, so the number of lines going through that imaginary bag equals uh, E dot the area which is the the flux equals whatever is inside divided by epsilon zero okay so that that is called Gauss law we, we did that at the beginning of the semester so we can try to do the same thing with magnetism so I'm going to ask you that so let's say you have a magnet And it's, it's not moving. And of course, you're going to have a magnetic field going around. I have to move faster. Okay, I'm behind now. here. So it's circulating, circulating, circulating. And let's say, uh, let me make more. One, one more here. So let me ask you something here. If I take a bag, if I take a bag and imaginary bag, okay, plastic bag, and it's closed here, and I put my magnet inside like I did here, what's going to be the flux? So it's going out, but here it's going in. What's going to be the total flux of the magnetic field for the bag? Very good. It's going to be zero because I have as many lines going out that I have going in. So that translates the, the fact that is translating the fact that you do not have monopole. So pop quiz question, you know, what's the flux in that case, you know? The flux will be the number of lines poking through. Out is positive, in is negative. The flux is zero. And if you do algebra, not algebra, calculus, so the, the electric field going through a closed surface, so that's your bag, is by definition, the dot product between E and DA, and that's going to be Q in over epsilon zero. So you can think that's the source here. That's a consequence. So you have the same thing for a magnetic field. It's going to be the flux through a closed surface. So that's your bag. B, DA. Okay, so you are counting how many lines go through that surface equals zero. So that's called Gauss law for magnetism. And congratulations, you have two equations of Maxwell equations, right? Maxwell equations are very famous. The only four of them will describe anything in electricity, magnetism, so electromagnetism. They, they are the best known equation. So if you want to crash a party, you know, you go, you have your T-shirt with your four equations of Maxwell and no one will talk to you. So they will leave you alone. 
Okay, so that we talked about already, you know, Orster, the experiment happened in Copenhagen. He was not a researcher, he was not like a tenure, he was just a public lecturer. But people really loved him because he was very good at explaining uh, the physics at the time, they were working uh, on um, uh, uh, batteries, right? The electricity was just uh, uh, like Volta just invented the battery for the first time. It just happened that on his desk, he he had a magnet and, and the magnet starts to spin. So all of a sudden, magnetism and electricity were connected. And they didn't thought so. So then that's when you had electromagnetism. So current, which is moving charge, create magnetism. So I already talked about that, but I have a video, short video of an experiment. I, I wish I could do the, 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 I had more demonstration to show you here. So I have video, okay, that's better than nothing. Poof. You see, you have electricity flowing, and then the magnetis, the magnetic field will circulate around the wire. It will magnetize that needle, okay, that will show you the magnetic field lines. I can I can show you this demo also. Maybe you did that during the lab. Did you do this one? So you have a solenoid, inductor, coil, okay, you're going to have electricity going through, and this is called an electromagnet, we talked about that, and you're going to have a magnetic field, you know, expanding around. It will take time for the magnetic field to expand around. If you shove in a core, like a piece of iron, you are collating the magnetic field that try to escape, bring them in, so you intensify the magnetic field, okay? It's, a, it's an electric it magnet. Like it's coiled here, it's coiled wire, it's set to be nuclear plastic, and all I'm going to do is take my iron bars and sprinkle them on to nuclear plastic, and then if I tap that plastic ice, then you'll see that the magnetic, that there's iron filings line up along the magnet. Side that you can see that the magnetic field runs parallel to the plane in that point. And that is how you can see those magnetic field lines on the inside of the coil of the wire. Okay, okay, this time I'm going to show you basically the same things I've never done to do couples that have inside the coil. You can see now the couple fields are basically running in a point one perpendicular to the plane. The coil was in the plane, the coil was in the point one perpendicular to the plane. The coil, and all I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the switch and turn my current on again. The current turns on the coil. See, as soon as I switch the switch, that now the compass needles will react to the magnetic field that's produced by the coil that's in the plane. And now they're lining themselves up parallel to the plane. Isn't that cool? So actually, you can do your right hand like this. And that will show you the north. So, for example, that could be the north, that could be the south, if the current is looping around this way. The magnetic field inside will be uniform, constant, same direction, same magnitude. Outside, it will be very weak. So, for problems in physics, we usually say that the magnetic field outside is zero. This is very important. It's called the inductor. Inductor is like a capacitor, okay? Except that the inductor will resist the buildup of current when the capacitor resists the buildup of voltage. The coil, because that is how the magnetic field is created. The magnetic field will lodge the magnetic field inside the coil. The magnetic field lines will run parallel to the plane of the coil. So you can see if I flip that switch, they go back to where they were perfectly So super cool. Uh, we already talked about that. That will be an electromagnet. You can use your right hand to find that, for example, electricity is flowing in this direction. Your thumb showing the north. Here, that will be the south. So we talked about that already. Uh, William Sturgeon is famous to have used those electromagnets and make them more efficient. 
and then they went around i will show you that next uh, unit you know uh, to to shock people okay so each time there is a new technology around so medical fields you know want to use it and so then they decided that shocking people will cure disease um, maybe it does i don't know but he's the one who developed those very strong electromagnets he was an engineer okay and then the ugly calculus that I'm not going to go into details too much because you need the calculus two or three. So this is called Bayot Savar, the Bayot Savar law. And so far I told you that electricity is making magnetism, but I didn't give you the equation. So now I'm giving you the equation, right? So Bayot Savar says that when you have a small element of current, Okay, so a tiny element of current here. So it works the same way. Uh, you're going to create here at point P a magnetic field. And that will be your equation. So it's a small piece here. So it's not a full magnetic field. So by the says that each piece of current, each delta L, Okay, it's a cross project, so that will be a small element of current going this way. That will be your vector position, so it looks like so. And that will be your magnetic field, but it's a small delta V. So if you want to find the all magnetic field here, you have to integrate. You have to integrate over the whole wire. Okay. So I'm not going to go into details because otherwise I will lose. I already lost like three-fourths of the class. I am left with one-fourth. <laughs> I don't want to get to one-eight. Um, so anyway, but still it's a calculus-based class, so I have to mention that law. And interestingly, it's one over R square. So it's an inverse square law. Could be conceptual question, right? Bayot Savar is an inverse square law, very much like the electric field from the beginning of the semester. Remember that the electric field was falling as a distance square. So you have the one over R square. However, when you're going to integrate, then the magnetic field will be one over R. Because if you take the integral of one over R square, and you get 1 over r. So it's the calculus part. And that's, let me give you the final answer here. So, for example, for a long wire, a very long wire, the magnetic field is going to circulate around. So it's going to be very strong close to the wire. It's going to be weaker as you move around. You already knew that. You take your right hand. And uh, it's, the equation is 1 over r. Okay, Because when you do the integration of 1 over r squared, you get 1 over r. So how do we get that result? So write that down somewhere. You know, that will be the magnetic field produced by a wire a current carrying wire with a current I, mu zero is the magnetic constant. So it's going to be 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7. I is the current 2 pi. Uh, I is the current 2 pi. R is the distance from here. And um, if you go here, for those who are engineers, or, or if you are if you are physics major, uh, I highly recommend that you go through the steps of the computations. 
because you are supposed to be good at calculus since it's a calculus based class and you you see it's not that hard actually okay so you know that you have a small element here you have your vector position so at p you're going to have a delta b and then you have to integrate along that length here so i'm not going to explain because i know i'm going to lose half of you but you can do the you can look at the math i highly recommend that you do that and at the end you have this equation okay so for so you see here a long wire or any any wire like this wire here actually you know going into my laptop i have dc so i have electricity going into my laptop so you, I have a magnetic field here. On the other side, this is AC. So you're going to have a magnetic field doing this, magnetic field going that, magnetic field in one direction, magnetic field in the other direction. Okay, magnetic field go through you and can induce current inside you. So anyway, so that will be the magnetic field. So let me ask you something. Uh, uh, maybe we do that for next time, for next quiz, next pop quiz. So you have two currents of three currents, I1 going into the blackboard, I2 going into the blackboard, I3 going into the blackboard, and that's a square here. First step, can you draw the net magnetic field. Can you do that? So use your right hand. Think just what we have learned. I'm just asking you to draw the magnetic field produced by I1, the magnetic field produced by I3, the magnetic field produced by I2. Okay, I will ask you that. Could be a good question on the test three for example, just draw. And, and then you, you will have to find the net magnetic field, okay? So here, for example, you have I1 going into the blackboard. So it's going to make a magnetic field that will circulate. Which way it's going at that point here? So you want to trace B1. Do you understand what to do? So you take your pen and you do it. You don't stare. Staring doesn't work in the pen. You go here and it's going to make a magnetic field that will circulate around, right? And you do the same for I1, I2, I3. So just trace it, right? So I1 going into the blackboard, magnetic field circulating. So just trace B1. And then you do the same thing for, for I2 and the same thing for I3. So just trace B1, B2, B3. Okay, so tr do, do it on your black, uh, on your uh, notebook. So B1, which, which way it goes? Down, very good. So we have B1 this way. Okay. Uh, what about B3? To the left. Excellent. Excellent. So B2 and B1, uh, they have exactly the same magnitude because they are at the same distance. So it's mu0 i... 2 pi r, is that the right uh, equation? Yeah. Okay, so the only dif uh, difficulty is at that point here, you have to make a circle, right? It's because it circulates. So B2, oh, that's, that was, uh, that's 3 here, right? I did a mistake. So B2 will be 
at an angle here. Does it make sense? Okay, it's not even physics here. We're talking about geometry 101. Right or not? Yes? Okay. And, and then you remember physics 1, uh, you are adding vectors. Okay, and that angle here, that angle here is 40, 45 degrees, right? Because it's a diagonal, so this is 45 degrees here. So the first step, I, I like, like when you did the electro, uh, electric field, uh, one way to do it, so first you find just the magnitude. So B1 equals B3 equals, and you just plug it in. So let's find the magnitude, okay? So 4 pi 10 to the negative 7, that's mu 0 times 2 times 2 pi times 0 0.01, if I don't do mistake. So that goes bye-bye. So 4 times 10 to negative 7. So dividing by 0 0.01 is like you multiply by 100. Is that right? Did you get that? Yeah? And then I, I forgot uh, the... The diagonal of a square, I think you have to take the square root of 2, right? That, di that diagonal here, D, is the square root of 1 plus 1. Okay, so it's square root of 2 uh, centimeter. And square root of 2 is like about 144 centimeters. Is that right? Are you with me on that? Okay, so B2, B2 equals 4 pi 10 to the negative 7 times 2 amps over 2 pi times 0 0.0144 one, two, by, 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 by. Uh, how much is that? Huh? Is that, is that right? Okay. So then we have the X component and the Y component. So X component, you're going to have, um, it's going to be negative. So you have B3 and then that. Okay, so it's going to be minus B3 minus B2 cosine 45. And then B, Y is also going to be negative. Not that we really care, okay? We can take left to be positive and down to be negative. But you want to make sure that you add and, and not subtract. I hope it's right. So it's going to be minus B1 minus B2 and sine 45. Which, which we don't care because they are equal to each other. And, and then you can take B, the magnetic field is going to be the square root of, forget about the negative sign, Bx squared plus By squared. Yes? Do you all agree with that? 
it's it's from the first semester right you you have to find any question let me know you you have to find the x component so that that here that that vector here has two components remember from uh, first semester it has a x component here and it has a y component so let's see Okay, 2.8. So look at that. They are uh, they, they 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 round they rounded to three times ten to negative five. Okay, so that's good. We got we got that right. Oh look at that. We got that right too. Minus and minus, and you have your cosine here. So that will be the answer. And of course that y component will be the same because it's symmetric on the x-axis and y-axis. See. So once you have the x component, you can find the y component. Okay, cool, cool. And and, and then you use Pythagorean theorem uh, to find the magnetic field. Right? It's, it's a free online textbook. Cool. We didn't have that at my time. Free stuff. A lot of free stuff. Uh, so you have the link here. Any question? Okay, did you have time to uh, to write it down? Okay. Maybe I will do a pop quiz or for the test three, I don't know. Okay, so you see here again, magnetic field will circulate. Very strong here. So we have the lines here close to each other. As a representation, so it's like a contour line, and you the distance increases because it gets weaker. The magnetic field, like typical conceptual question, okay? The magnetic field goes with the inverse of the distance, so it's inversely proportional. So you multiply the distance by two, the electric field will be divided by two. Okay, same thing here. So that I will, uh, okay, pop quiz, good question, so I don't have to make one. And that we just did. Okay, let's try to do this one. Two step, you have, a, what do you have? You have a current. The current will produce a magnetic field that will circulate around. At that location, the magnetic field will be in this direction. That usually you have to figure it out. And you have a charge moving in this direction. So very beautiful flower. We're going to have a force here, perpendicular to the velocity. So it's going to start. Uh, what it's going to do? It's, it's going to move. It's, it's going to go in a circle. Up and down. Not here, okay? So that shows the magnetic field. It doesn't show the orbit of the charge. The charge wants to go in a straight line at a constant speed. No, you can't. So anyway, you do it in two steps. The question is find, find the force. So the force is perpendicular to V. Force equals QVB. So first you need to find the magnetic field and then you find the force. Okay, so do it. You can help each other. You know what's going to happen? The charge, the charge is still start to go around like this. So, are you doing it? Okay. So, by definition, is mu zero i. 
2 pi times that distance here. So it's going to be 4 pi 10 to the negative 7, 3, 2 pi times 0 0.05 by 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 by. So you have a 2 here. So you have a 6. 6 times 10 to negative 7 divided by 0 0.05. What do you get? Five, very good, Tesla. So if there is a magnetic field and there is a charge and the charge is moving and the charge has a component perpendicular to B, so then, only then, you have a magnetic field, Q, V, B, sine the angle between B, uh, B, and V, and that doesn't matter because that's going to be equals to 1. So magnetic force will be the charge, which is 6.5 times 10 to negative 6 Coulomb times V, which is 280 times B, which is 1.2 times 10 to the negative 5. You have to do a better job than I'm doing because we cannot see anything that I'm writing here. And I found 2.2 times 10 to negative 8 Newton. Did you get that? Right? So that's easy. It comes from an algebra based book. not hard. Oh, there is no solution. But I guess that's a solution. Did you get it? Did you get that? Huh? Yeah, okay, cool. And then, interestingly, a lot of application in engineering is that when you have two current and with um, two wires with current inside what's going to happen they they're going to apply a force on each other okay so if the current are moving in the same direction typical conceptual question you know they're going to attract each other and if they are moving in the opposite direction they're going to repel each other that's for the same reason that we have seen here so it means that current I1 is going to produce a magnetic field here going up. Okay, so going up here. So you see the magnetic field here is up. So I1, magnetic field is up. The force is toward I2. Do you understand? Take your hand here. So that current I1 is making the magnetic field here up. I1 up, the force is toward the other wire. So if the current moves in the same direction, the force is attractive, right? So this one, you have the magnetic field. Magnetic field is up, very beautiful flower. So they attract each other. And that's an issue sometimes when you walk by huge transformers outside, especially in Miami, you have those ugly transformers outside because nothing can be buried in Miami uh, because of the water, obviously. And you hear those humming sounds. You know, that's because inside you have wires oscillating back and forth, right? Because you have AC. Let's see, I have a few videos. Now, I have a demonstration. MIT. Now, I, 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 I actually, uh, I have something better. But 
Uh, no, I, I don't know. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. To answer the question, consider the facts. A flowing current produces a magnetic field. And a magnetic field applies a force to a moving electric charge. Therefore, since an electric current is nothing but moving electric charges, it follows then that flowing electric currents apply magnetic forces to each other. Currents flowing in the same direction attract each other. And currents flowing in opposite directions repel each other. In fact, the unit of electric current is defined in terms of the force between two wires. Perhaps that's why it's called the ampere or amp for short. But Monsieur Ampere did something even more practical and definitely more profound than lending his name to a unit of electric current. Ampere created electrodynamics, the theory that magnetism is electricity in motion. It was a promising theory that, among other things, could explain... So what you have here is a coil shaped like a donut, and it's called a toroid. So if you are in computer stuff, you know, you look at your motherboard, for example, you have a lot of those little things here because it's used to remove in the, the noise. magnetic fields of straight wires, loops, or even a toroid. It's, the, it's called a toroid. But what about the field of the lower magnet? Here, too, Ampere had a wide idea that there must be currents inside the magnet itself. He imagined that each atom of a magnetic material must have a circulating electric charge that produces a magnetic field. And in fact, the spinning loop has circulating electric charges in its core, which create the magnetic field that attracts a composite. Therefore, the... Okay, and you have the same thing by MIT, so, but, but they didn't, um... okay, let's do it quick. So, opposite direction, attract, same direction. Okay, so you can uh, you you can show what's the equation. It's very easy to easy to show. You know, you find the magnetic field produced by I one at that location, and then you use that equation here, I L B. Do you remember the force applied on the current by a magnetic field is I L B. And, and you have that equation here. It's very easy, it's very basic algebra. So the force, that will be the length of the wire, that will be current one, current two, R is the distance between them. Okay, let me ask you something here. So you have current flowing this way, is it going to attract to repel? Attract, so it will tighten. Does it make sense? So then we will talk about current loop. We already did that, right? It's a magnetic dipole because we cannot have a monopole. Magnetic field like to circulate and if you look really far away from the dipole, the magnetic field will depend on 1 over the distance to the third power. 
the same way like you have an electric dipole, you have a magnetic dipole. And, but we, we, we did that already last unit. So what's the equation? Um, to find the magnetic field at the center of a loop. Do you remember when you have a loop of current, it's going to create a magnetic field here? At the center, the equation is this. And you have to use Biot Sava to show that. But the steps are very easy. So I highly recommend if you are a physics major or engineer uh, to look how we can prove that. But it's easy. So let's, let's try a last application. So now you have two equations. At point C, okay, you're going to have magnetic field produced by I2, by the loop. And that would be the equation here. That's the equation of the magnetic field produced by a magnetic, uh, uh, an electric loop, a loop of current going around. And that will be the magnetic field produced by a wire. So you have two kinds of equations, magnetic field produced by a long wire, magnetic field produced by a loop. Here, the magnetic field here at the center, it has that equation there. So first, can you trace B? Can you do that? Trace B1 and B2. You have three minutes to do it, okay? You can do it. So B1, B1 circulating. So is it going to be up or down? B2 in or down. Okay. So here, B2 in. and this one you can do that. Someone doesn't like physics. Is that clear or no? So you have uh, which one is uh so the, the distance here is the same, but which one is weaker when you compare both? The, the top one, because here I have a pi, right? Yes? Okay, so B1 is up, and B2 is down. So when I'm going to do the math, I'm, I'm going to have to subtract from each other. So the net force is going to be down. Check, 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 check that to make sure that I didn't do mistake. Is that clear? It's like an engineering uh, question, kind of thinking that you have to make, right? So it goes down and up. So up and down, and, and the down is bigger because here you don't have a pi. So then all you have to do is plug it in. So the first thing you do in physics or engineering, you, you, you like to draw stuff. Oh, but look, this, the currents are not the same. So this one does not have to be smaller because it has a greater current.
Oh, actually, this the produce B1 is bigger because it has more current, right? So what I said was true if you have the same current. Here, you don't have the same current. That current here is 8 amps, and that current here is 2 amps, right? Is that clear? So I skip the calculus part, like this one here, I'm skipping it, I'm just giving you the answer, but I highly recommend that you do it if you are in engineering and physics, you know, I'm, I'm kind of skipping it because a lot of you I find out are in marine biology so, or biology, so I'm not sure you don't need to go into details in the calculus, but if you are in physics, even computer science, you don't need that. But, but if you are in physics, you, you have to, okay? If your major is physics, you have to. If it's uh, mechanical engineering, you have to. Civil, not really. Okay, so we'll... Uh... Ooh, Ampere's law is super cool. Super cool. Look, 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 look. We are almost there. The four equations. Almost the four equations of... Maxwell, super cool. And uh, okay, so you have a pop quiz. Let me know if you see it. Do you see it? Okay. 